Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're joining us from. I am Nadine Alamy, uh, the Executive Director of the Taylor Geospatial Institute, and I want to welcome you all to our webinar on water utilities and lead line inventory using GIS, a part of a series on asset management using GIS for state and local government. Uh, thank you in advance and again and again to Bad Elf for sponsoring and leading um, this webinar. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today. I've been a geospatial cheerleader for a long time. And right now what I'm doing at my institute is to fuel this revolution in the uptake of geospatial research and technology. And I'm still amazed, I'm still amazed at the opportunities that geospatial and GIS enables. And I think this webinar is a great example. The power of using geospatial GIS to track water utilities and lead line inventory. Think about it for a minute. Do you drink water? Yes. Well, the US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, estimates that drinking water can make up 20% or more of a person's total exposure to lead. And I think you know that lead is dangerous. Medical public health experts agree that there's no safe level of lead in our human bodies and especially harmful to babies and young children. Let me tell you some, something else. The US EPA has also estimated that there are currently six to 10 million lead service lines across the United States, which was a big driver for this $15 billion commitment in the Infrastructure Act to replace lead pipes that connect homes to drinking waters and an additional $11.7 billion that can be used by communities for any drinking water infrastructure, including removal of lead service lines and replacing them. So how do you track all of that? Take a guess, GIS. GIS is how water utilities track and prioritize their investments and in their water lines. That's why we're here today. But before I introduce the amazing panel of experts, can we learn a little bit about you? So if you can answer this quick poll on who you are and where you're located, that would help us to get to know you a little bit better. And in return, you can ask all the questions that you want <laughs> in the Q&A panel. So I'm really happy, uh, as you can tell, to be joined here today to discuss this topic on uh, water utilities, lead inventory using GIS. We have an expert panel representing solution providers and users. So we will be joined by um, two amazing people from Esri, Howard Crovers and Alex Kayback. So they'll be talking about Esri's solutions. We'll be joined by Brian Peckinpah, the Deputy Director of Public Affairs at the Detroit Water and Sewage Department. And I don't know if you know this, but Detroit has 80,000 lead services in a city that spans 139 square miles. So Brian will be talking about how they, how they manage all of that. We'll be joined by David Grafton, uh, the geospatial lead at Bed Elf, the sponsor for this webinar and the series. And he'll be talking about it, their solution to provide assistance to organizations that are trying to be compliant with the national primary drinking water regulations. Um, the lead and copper rule revisions. You'll be hearing a lot about that today. And last but not least, I'm very pleased to be joined by the VP of Marketing at Blue Conduit, uh, Dr. Dunry Grayling. And um, the focus will be highlighting the case studies on how cities use 
GIS, statistics, machine learning to track, develop inventories and make sense of all of this. So before I introduce, uh, you know, or, you know, uh, uh, invite Howard Crothers and Alex K back to the stage, if we can um, give you one last second for the poll and see the poll results, fantastic. Uh, so you can see that we have a majority in local government followed by industry. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you, state, federal, academia, everybody for joining us. And uh, we have a majority uh, of people coming from the United States, but I would like to especially thank the folks from uh, the other regions in, on the world, from Europe and Asia and various time zones for also joining us today because this is a global issue. Uh, our health is a global issue. Our water is a global issue. So with that, if, if uh, Howard and Alex would please come on the stage and kick us off with the presentation on Esri Solutions. That would be great. Thanks, Nadine. So I'm Howard Crothers from Esri, and I manage Esri's ArcGIS Solutions utility development team. And co-presenting with me today is Alex Kayback, and Alex is a product engineer on our team. And today, Alex and I are going to talk about Esri's lead service line inventory ArcGIS solution. Now, if you're unfamiliar with ArcGIS solutions, they are a collection of freely available and fully supported industry-specific configurations of ArcGIS. So these give you maps and apps that help organizations do uh, industry-specific workflows. And one of the industries that we provide ArcGIS solutions for is uh, the utilities industry. And included in our utilities industry, ArcGIS solutions collection is a lead service line inventory ArcGIS solution. Now, before we get into the solution itself, let's take a step back. And Nadine already did an excellent job of this, talking about the dangers of lead, and particularly lead in drinking water. So what happened is in late 2021, the EPA released the lead and copper rules revision. And we in the water industry commonly just abbreviate that to the LCRR. And what the LCRR does is it makes identifying and removing lead service lines a priority for all water utilities in the U.S. Now, the LCRR itself is a very, very comprehensive rule set. And if you do work in the water industry, you should absolutely take the time to read the entire rule set because there are a lot of things that you need to do as an organization. One of the things you're required to do, and this is required to be uh, done by October 16th, 2024, is to do an initial lead service line inventory and provide that to uh, regulatory agencies. So this is less than a year away. If you uh, are doing this and haven't done much of your inventory, or certainly if you haven't begun, uh, you are on the clock. You do not have a lot of time, less than a year, to get that initial inventory done and submitted. Now, once you submit your initial inventory, you are then required to do annual updates. Um, but if you have lead service lines in your service territory, more than likely you're going to do uh, more frequent updates, ideally near real-time updates as you identify and remove uh, lead service lines in your territory. Now, one of the things that the LCR also requires you to do is to make your lead service line uh, inventory publicly available. Now, the good news, there's increasingly funding available to you. Uh, and what I'm very excited about, there's a lot of best practices that are evolving because there are literally thousands of water utilities that are doing this right now. And we're hearing great information being shared amongst the water utility community. You're going to hear some great information from uh, Detroit uh, in a few minutes. We're also seeing a lot of great technology being used to uh, to help solve this problem. So you'll hear uh, from Blue Conduit and Bad Elf shortly too about how you can take advantage of their technology. The last thing we should talk about very briefly is what do we mean when we say a water service line? Uh, a service line is the pipe that connects a water main to the plumbing at a property. And it's typical in the US and many countries that the water utility owns part of that line and then the uh, 
customer owns the other side. So in the US, it's typical that the water utility owns from the main to a curb stop valve or maybe a, um, a water meter in a meter box. And then the customer owns the rest of the line all the way to the uh, plumbing on the premise. What this means is that each side of the line could be a different material and each side of the line could have been installed at different times. So you could have uh, lead on either side of the line or maybe both. Uh, you may also have fittings and couplings uh, that are joining segments of those lines together that also could have lead materials in them. Now, this is a huge problem. It's estimated that there are over 9 million lead service lines uh, in the US today. In fact, this is such a big problem that about three years ago, a number of water utilities approached ESRI and they asked us to help create a solution to uh, enable them to do their lead service line inventories. What we did is we created our lead service line inventory ArcJS solution, and that helps you streamline performing your service line inventory. It gives you the capabilities to manage your replacement programs. It helps you comply with the LCRR, and it also gives you the ability to do uh, the uh, share your lead service line inventory with the public. When you deploy the lead service line inventory solution, what you get is this focused set of maps and apps. They're all pre-configured. They all immediately work out of the box as a system. What you get is a lead service line inventory uh, ArcGIS Pro project and a lead service line editor web application. Those are really great for mapping technicians who are working in the office who need to do things like use tab cards or uh, use as built or plumbing records to begin to create your service line inventory. Now, much of the work has to happen in the field. These are either uh, material confirmations or maybe uh, material assessments where you don't have great records. And for that, we provide a lead service line uh, field map for your mobile staff. We also provide a set of viewers. So we provide a lead service line uh, web viewer that lets anybody in your utility securely view your inventory. We provide a lead service line replacement manager web application that's intended for engineers to uh, manage your replacement activities. We also provide a lead service line dashboard that lets your organization ensure that your activities uh, are keeping you compliant with the LCRR. So you're gonna track yourself against key performance indicators there. For the public, we provide a lead safe community hub site. And that's both a place for your organization to tell your story about how you are proactively complying with the LCRR, as well as uh, sharing your lead service line inventory with a public uh, viewing web application. And that provides a very stripped down and simple view of your, uh, your inventory. So it's easy for the public to understand. We also provide the ability to uh, sh that you can share with your uh, your customers a material self survey, and there's a lot of water utilities that are enlisting their uh, customers in a initial assessment. So this is an application, and you'll see this in a minute, where. Uh, your customers are able to do their own self-assessment and it guides them on how to do it. And then when they submit their self-assessment, what you do is you use the self-assessment manager to triage that information as it comes in and then either up, uh, update your inventory or uh, take further action if necessary. And then you're going to use the self-assessment uh, dashboard to monitor your responsiveness and make sure that you're being responsive to the information coming into your utility. You can deploy lead service line inventory to either ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. And when you deploy it, what you get is all those maps, as well as the schema, the services, and the groups to make sure that you have uh, securely, you're able to securely provide access to the folks that uh, either need to edit the data or access the data within your organization. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand this over to Alex and Alex is gonna demonstrate the system to you in action. Great, thanks Howard. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate the lead service line inventory solution. Thank you. So I'm going to demonstrate the lead service line inventory solution to show how you can create and update a lead service line inventory. Uh, once you have that inventory, be able to uh, share it within your organization as well as with the community and also reporting to your privacy agency. And also to be able to manage and monitor that service line inventory. So to get started, let's look at the legend on the right-hand side. 
So we are showing the service lines as points instead of lines. Now that seems kind of weird, but we've seen this as a common trend. It is a great way to be able to show the lead category of both the utility side of the service line, the utility owned side and the private owned side, the customer owned side as Howard just mentioned. Um, so you can see from the legend that we have four different categories. Those are the categories specified by the EPA. We have lead um, that's represented by red, galvanized requiring replacement, which is a galvanized pipe that is or has been at some point downstream of a lead service line. Uh, that's in yellow. We have non-lead in blue and we have unknown in gray. So you see we have 16 different combinations there. So there's a few different ways to start creating your lead service line inventory with the solution. One is by loading your existing data in. Um, we also have a few different ways to start adding service lines. Uh, so one way would be the lead service line editor web app, which is what we're looking at right now. And how, as Howard mentioned, there's also a field map to be able to be uh, collect data out in the field, as well as a, an ArcGIS Pro project for your more robust editing experience. So see, uh, I won't be able to show the field map in the ArcGIS Pro project today for the sake of time, but we can show the lead service line editor web application. Um, so it's pretty simple to be able to update an existing service line. You can click a point, and from there, you'll get your attributes. You'll see that it's laid out with um, a lot of the, the statistics from the uh, EPA's template, which I'm going to talk about a little later as well. Um, it's kind of divided into utility side, so you'll get to the utility information first. As you keep scrolling, you'll start to see the customer side information, and those mirror each other. If you wanted to add a new service line, we also have edit templates created for you. Um, so if we wanted to add a service line that had lead on both sides of the service line, we can choose lead lead. We can then add it to the map and same thing. We could start filling out the attributes on the left-hand side. Here you'll see that we have a required attribute here, the entire service line status. Uh, the reason we made that required is in the EPA's template, that is a required attribute. Once you have your inventory, you're gonna to wanna to start sharing that inventory out within your, within your organization. And a great way to do that is with the lead service line viewer application. Uh, so with this application, you could search for an address using the search bar at the top. You can also filter the information. So if you only wanted to see lead service lines, uh, you could turn the lead filter on and that's gonna only, that's gonna filter out everything that does not have lead. It also includes a table here at the bottom. Um, and as you start to filter the map, it'll also filter the table as well. So if we turn the lead off and we turn on non-lead, you'll see that the filter at the bottom, uh, that the table at the bottom will filter as well. So once you have your, your inventory and you realize that you do have some lead service lines and you need to start the replacement process, we also include the lead service line replacement manager. So this is not a, a replacement for a work order system or anything like that. It's really more for visual purposes. Um, it allow you to see, if we look at the legend on the right-hand side, uh, the service lines that do not need replacement, uh, the ones that do need replacement, the ones that have been scheduled to be replaced, and also the replaced lead service lines. It does allow you to update some attributes in here as well, and you could also filter. Um, so right now it's set to need replacement. Um, it has all four categories within here that you can set. We could turn that on. You're going to be left with only the red circles, which need to be replaced. Um, and then it also includes a batch attribute editor. And here's where you can update uh, the service lines that need to be replaced to scheduled for replacement. So if you knew a scheduling date and you want to select a couple of service lines, you can change that replacement status to scheduled replacement. And then depending on which side of the service line needs to be replaced, typically uh, they're requiring both sides to be replaced. If there is lead, um, you could set that replacement date and then click save. And you'll see that those points will disappear from the map because we have it set to a needs replacement filter, when we turn that filter off, you'll see that they're now the yellow triangles and scheduled to be replaced. We also include a dashboard. And within this dashboard, we have the totals in each category across the top. Down the left-hand side, we have the verified service lines versus the total number of service lines. And we also have the total number of replaced lead service lines. In the middle, uh, we have a table. And this table is identical to the EPA's template. So some of the field titles may look a little bit different, um, but they're the same field in the exact same order as the template uh, with the exact same values provided as well. Uh, and we provide a download data button here at the bottom and clicking that you'll get a CSV in Excel that you can then copy and paste the information into the EPA's template 
uh, into their report and it will copy exactly in the same order uh, that the EPA template is in. Now we know some states are adopting the EPA's template, but they may be changing some fields around. Um, so you'll have to make some adjustments on your end uh, to match your privacy agency. We also include an RTIS hub site to communicate with the community. Uh, this is a website that's pre-configured, but can be customized um, and branded towards your organization. Um, all the, you know, all these uh, sentences, all the words can be replaced with your own wording. Um, we also include, as Howard mentioned, the water service line materials survey. So that's a survey that the customer can fill out to report the material on their side of the service line. In talking with a lot of utilities, we've, we've discovered that a lot of utilities have the information on the utility side of the service line, but they really don't know in a lot of cases on what's on the customer side of the service line. So this is a way for the customer to communicate uh, with the utility, fill out their information. They, uh, we provide a link out to determine what the material is. So it instructs them on how to determine that. Um, they can then report the material and it also requires a photo so that the utility can confirm what the customer is reporting. And as these submissions come in, and I'll get to this in just a moment, we do have an application to help triage these submissions coming in. We also provide some statistics on the total number of lead service lines and then the amount that have been replaced. Um, a public facing map uh, where a customer can search for their address. Uh, they have pop-ups in here that are very simple to read, um, divided into utility owned versus customer owned. Uh, and we also change this, the, the symbols for this map as well. We don't do the split point for this. It's a little bit confusing for the customers. Um, and essentially what we do is because there is the utility side and the customer side, we take whatever's, for lack of a better term, uh, worse, right? So if, if you have a the utility side is lead and the customer side is non-lead, we'll put it on here as lead. It will be symbolized as lead. There's a section on what the community is doing to reduce lead exposure in the water system. Again, this can all be customized uh, to what you need and you can add sections, you can remove sections. And then a section on how lead affects health. Um, you can provide your own image into this section. And this is similar to the, uh, what Howard showed earlier, describing what a service line is, what the customer is responsible for versus what the utility is responsible for. So as I mentioned, um, as those surveys start coming in from the customers, we do include a service line self-assessment manager um, application. So this will allow you to, you can click on a submission, it'll populate into the um, bottom left-hand corner. You can see all the information that the customer filled out. You can see the status of the submission. So right now it's received. Um, and you could also update that using the pencil there. You can update this from received to in progress to completed. Uh, and you could also view the image that they submitted. So here's an image of a, a service line within a basement. We also include a dashboard to help monitor those submissions coming in as well. So you could see the total number of submissions coming in um, and which have been submitted, received, uh, in progress and completed. On the left-hand side, we have current submissions. Um, so clicking one of those submissions, we get the same uh, pop-up that we saw er just earlier. So you could see that progress bar and you could also see the um, image that was submitted by the customer. Same thing on the right-hand side, we have completed submissions over here. So we can click that uh, and get the same pop-up down here as well. So that is the lead service line inventory solution. And the way, how, so how you get that solution and deploy it, uh, the, the quickest and easiest way would be to go to esriurl.com slash lead. You can also find it in RTS Online and RTS Enterprise in the solutions app. So there is a solutions app that's provided in both RTS Online and Enterprise um, with a whole host of solutions and you can find it within there as well. Um, going to that link, you'll get to this uh, splash page that has more information on the lead service line inventory solution. You can click deploy now and it will start the deployment process. You can also click learn more and it will bring you out to our documentation. And now I will send it over to Brian Peckinpah from Detroit Water and Sewerage. Thank you very much, Alex. That was a very helpful presentation. Glad to hear all the improvements in the ArcGIS system. I'm going to share my screen for my presentation. My name is Brian Peckinpah. I'm the Public Affairs Director for the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department. Here we go. So my presentation is on our lead service line replacement program 
and how we utilize GIS to prioritize where we replace lead service lines. And I've been with the Department of uh, Water and Sewage in the city of Detroit since 2016 and was previously with uh, a city council member. So I had, do have uh, more than 10 years of government experience. Now, to give you perspective, for those that aren't familiar with Detroit, Detroit is a very large geographic area. As Nadine said earlier in the, this webinar, um, you can fit San Francisco, Boston, and Manhattan within our footprint. We're very large. Uh, please ignore the population numbers. These are pretty old, but as far as um, our footprint, you can fit those three cities within the city of Detroit, which is 139 square miles. Now, our lead service line replacement program at the Detroit Water and Sewers Department, we started it in 2018. After the Flint water crisis, we realized that once you lose trust in the water system, it's very hard to regain it. And we even see that today, unfortunately, uh, most of the lead service lines in Flint have been replaced, but people in the city still don't trust the drinking water that's provided through those copper lines. So we took the proactive approach before Michigan provided the most stringent lead and copper rule in the United States, where we have to replace lead service lines in 20 years. We took the extra effort to start building a program, integrating it into our asset management program. In Detroit, we estimate we have 80,000 lead service lines, plus or minus 30,000. Again, that's an estimate. Uh, we replaced about 2,000 2, lead service lines, uh, mostly during water main replacement. And those are full lead service lines since 2018. 70% um, of our Detroit residents are below 200% of the federal poverty level. Again, 70% of our Detroit residents. And we are a community of mainly single family homes in the downtown and our midtown area. We do have townhouses, condos, apartment buildings, high rises, uh, but the rest of the city, most of the city is mainly single family homes and some duplexes. So given 80,000 lead service lines and the cost of inflation, we estimate that it's gonna cost us $800 million to replace lead service lines in the city of Detroit at the very least. Uh, we've been very fortunate with the by infrastructure program, the Biden administration and the EPA, as well as our state of Michigan has provided funding for us to accelerate our lead service line replacement program. And in the last year, we've received more than $90 million in federal and state funding for our program through the state revolving fund, through the American Rescue Plan Act, through our state of Michigan, um, through the EPA, as well as funds that we're providing uh, through our capital improvement program. Now, this is how we replace lead service lines. We also do, do the pull or the push, and that's us in the neighborhood replacing lines. We do have uh, hydro excavators too, as well for the inspections. Well, we, when we recreated excuse me, when we created the lead service line replacement program in Detroit, we integrated it into our engineering, public affairs, finance. We didn't create a separate team within our water and sewer department. We integrated it into our operations. There is a person that's a program manager for lead, and that's one individual, but everything else is in our operations, in the engineering and integrated within the organization. So in terms of outreach, our public affairs teams integrates that with our other projects. We provide picture filters. The important thing here is that um, we created a map also using our GIS. Uh, when we're at a house, either doing an inspection or a meter inspection, we created a map so that when we touch any service line, we are able to update 
any of our technicians, any of our contractors are able to update the data on the spot with this uh, mobile collector app. So at this time, I would like to uh, ask for a poll. My poll question is, um, when you are considering priority areas for lead service line replacements, what data inputs do you use? And please select all that apply or none of the above. And I'll give you a few minutes to think about that as I go to my next slide. Now, we mapped using ArcGIS, we used layers. So we took our data of known lead service line uh, replacement, uh, excuse me, known lead service lines, existing lead service lines based on meter appointments, based on permit data, and based on eyes on that house. We also um, mapped probable locations of lead service lines, again, based on the permit data. And when the house was built, um, Detroit, fortunately, um, we are very fortunate, the city officials back in 1948 changed the laws in the city of Detroit code, uh, no longer allowing lead service lines after 1948. So we were very fortunate. We would have many, many more than 80,000, if not for that decision in 1948. So you, we use that permit data. And we also use our mobile app data to determine where are the possible locations of the lead service lines. And here you see that data. The green data is we've had eyes on it. The red data is probable locations. Well, just to give you a, because we are a large ge geographic area, just to give you a, another look at a district, we have seven districts in the city of Detroit. This is how uh, our lead service lines, uh, probable locations look in a neighborhood or district area. And at this time, I'll uh, ask for the poll results. Oh, great. Yeah, very, very good results. So age of housing stock, that's definitely what we started with. So uh, permit data, uh, lead wa water testing results, because we do know uh, based on the leader, or the, we do five leaders in the state of Michigan. Uh, we ex expect the fifth leader is the service line. So we use that data too. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing or participating in the poll. Now, going back to our, our map, our larger map. So we mapped all these layers. And now we're going to also, you'll see these green shaded layers. So we took other layers, census tracts, census tracts of demographics, household income, census tracts of children in the home or seniors in the home, and then with the permit data, density of aged housing stock. So houses that were built in 1920 versus 1940 or 1960. Most city, city of Detroit homes were built before uh, 1950. Now we took that data and all those layers and we could prioritize neighborhoods. So we wanted to take our federal dollars that we received last year and prioritize the most vulnerable neighborhoods. When you have 80,000 lead service lines, where do you start? So we uh, considered that we needed to start with the most vulnerable populations, the most accessible, susceptible to lead in the drinking water. And I should say that in Detroit and our Southeast Michigan area, we're very fortunate that the elevated blood lead levels in children in our tri-county area, including Detroit, the source has not been the drinking water. So we're very fortunate of that fact because of our orthophosphate treatment and our protection measures in the city of Detroit in the tri-county area. But we came up with 15 neighborhoods or neighborhood areas that have all those characteristics of the data. They have low income, Households, density of low income households, households, houses that were built before 1948, houses that um, 
may have a density of children, seniors in the home. So we started, you'll see number one here in this uh, Southwest, the, we call this the Southwest Detroit area. It is very mainly Spanish speaking population. Uh, we started in that area and because of a vulnerable household density. Then we move, we're moving to other areas. This is our next area here towards the, just to give you a perspective, this is downtown Detroit. Um, this area here towards the middle of the city um, has the more aging housing stock and very high rate of occupancy in the houses. So we took that data and then we assigned contractors. We assigned contractors. Oh. We assigned contractors based on that data. Now we also have a dashboard that we created. And this is where we not only use ArcGIS, but we also partner with Blue Conduit to uh, have machine learning. Um, which then we will talk about and a little bit later. And we track our replacements. And you'll see in these charts here, this is the most recent. Uh, as of this week, our numbers have accelerated as we plan to, uh, as we got more contractor capacity and more dollars for lead service line replacements. And so you can see in this uh green area on our west side of our city. We've done a lot of replacements in that area. So that's in the housing stock isn't as old as when you get to the core of the city, which is why you're seeing more red down here versus up here has a combination of um, housing stock, some that may have been built in the 50s and 60s or they replaced their line, as well as uh, we've done many replacements in several projects in the west side of the city since 2018. And then you have these other charts here where we're replacing per week and our hydro excavation where we have the contractor go and excavate the stop box at each house before the crew uh, schedules an appointment for the lead service line replacement. So this is a dashboard that we're working on. We share internally, but we will have a public one that we'll be sharing. Uh, very soon. Now, just to give you perspective, we do use ArcGIS for many other uh, areas. Um, so we used it to do outreach for our water affordability program for door knocking. Uh, our lead service line replacement program is very robust. We've been featured in the American Water, water Works Association uh, newsletter, the journal. And just the, our community outreach is very extensive, just to touch on that real quick. Uh, we started a pilot program in 2018 and we've refined it. We do on the block community meetings with the uh, folks that are getting their lead service line replaced. And it starts 40 days out from when crews are actually on the street. We do very extensive outreach. We spend about $43 per house in advance of lead service line replacement. And these are the packets we deliver for the lead service line replacement program. And this is just some photos from our on the block uh, conversations with residents. These are recent photos from the spring. Um, we make sure we have direct contact with the residents. They understand why we're replacing the lead line and get their permission to replace the private portion. And here is my contact information. I will now turn it over to Mr. David Grafton of Bad Elf. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. Let me share my screen. All right. So today I'm going to give a quick review on how Bad Elf can help state and local governments and other smaller organizations create systems of record for asset management, specifically lead service line inventory today.
So we're going to launch a quick poll now to get a, a feel for how many of you are currently using GPS uh, in your organization in the field today. So if you wouldn't please mind answering that while uh, we cover the points we'll be heading on today. So you may be asking yourself, what the heck is a bad elk? Uh, we'll cover what we do and jump right into reviewing why performing a lead service line inventory is vitally important for your system of record and the advantages of having that system of record being a digital system, uh, as well as a geospatial system for overall just tracking the lead service lines. Obviously, at Bad Elk, we create uh, GPS receivers, and so location is absolutely key for us, so we'll talk about uh, accuracy and how to track all that valuable data that you're creating. Uh, how do you get there? Uh, we'll talk about how we go ahead and actually implement and deploy these solutions, some considerations you want to take, and finally a quick overview of our receivers. So to quick give a quick background on Battle GNSS, all GNSS is, is a fancy way to say GPS or global positioning systems that we utilize out of the field to collect data. For a little over 13 years now, Battle has been creating a line of GPS receivers that will power GIS professionals, surveyors, and other government entities to collect high accuracy field data using phones, tablets, and laptops. Laptops. You can connect anything to uh, a your phone uh, via Bluetooth. It's all a wireless connection. So when we first got started, we were one of the first companies in the world that created an iPod or iPhone plugin called the Lightning GPS, and that allowed these phones originally didn't have an integrated GPS to start being able to track where it was located in the world, either for uh, recreation or field data collection, whatever the application was. Uh, from there, we branched out to the aviation and the marine market. Uh, we went ahead and also moved into the GIS space from there when we started creating more high accuracy GPS receivers like the GNSS surveyor that some of you may be uh, familiar with. So all of our products would all work with all the different operating systems, whether it's iOS, Android, again, you just connect it via Bluetooth, as well as all of Esri's field data collection apps, including field maps, survey one, two, three, quick capture, so uh, no matter what you're using, we're going to be totally robust for your application. So all this has culminated into the creation of our Bad Elf Geospatial Enablement Team, uh, which I'm part of. We offer training and turnkey solutions to overcome common challenges among local governments with our uh, expertise, uh, experience, and obviously our affordable GNSS receivers. So we have a virtual in-person training that provides you with a simplified GIS solution and allows you to implement uh, all of these uh, awesome Esri products uh, for asset management, regulatory compliance, uh, just as smoothly as possible. Uh, obviously, uh, we have the experience and we work with a bunch of uh, customers similar to you. So uh, we were able to help you get across the finish line. Uh, so if we wouldn't mind wrapping up that poll now, uh, check out the results. Uh, so it looks like a good percentage of you are already using GNSS receivers in your workflows. Uh, that's awesome to see. Uh, we're definitely uh, you covered a couple of just best practices and how that could be integrated specifically for the lead service line uh, inventory uh, we're talking about today. So uh, to set the stage, uh, we'll just uh, understand why the regulations like lead and copper rule exist. Uh, it's to protect public health, long short of it. Uh, many local governments are struggling to meet compliance standards, however, for a variety of different reasons, uh, leading to significant challenges. So uh, lead and copper rule has been around for a while, uh, for the past 30 years here, and uh, subsequently revised uh, every so often, most recent one being 2021. And as uh, Howard stated, uh, the most next upcoming deadline is going to be in 2024. So the primary objective here is to establish stringent regulations to protect public health. The consequences of not following these guidelines can be dire, leading to a whole bunch of public health consequences, uh, neurological, cardiovascular, and it ultimately results in billions of dollars lost in health and infrastructure damages. So specifically for local governments attempting to comply with this. Uh, they're facing the challenges of limited resources. A lot of local governments don't have very significant GIS departments and relatively small uh, budgets compared to some other organizations. Uh, a lot of municipalities, especially uh, in the Midwest Northeast, have aging water distribution systems, which uh, include lead service lines, which were really common in the past. 
So you have to identify and then replace these lead surface lines, which is a costly and time consuming process. The EPA's rules, as I mentioned, are constantly evolving. So it can be tough to keep up with the new regulations and ensuring full compliance. And finally, you have to also establish your system of record. A lot of these uh, systems of record aren't in a nice, organized, uh, easily accessible state uh, where both public and internal uh, decision makers can simply uh, make decisions and identify where the places are need. Uh, we have to go ahead and transfer that to our digital system in order to uh, reach the maximum amount of people and uh, get uh, actually comply with all the EPA regulations. So uh, there's over 10 million lead pipes across the country. Uh, Wisconsin is actually leading uh, the country in most lead service lines per capita, one for every 20. Uh, so this is an uh, issue affecting you know hundreds and hundreds of municipalities across the country. So we uh, really want to help you out as far as implementing the solution and just future proofing your system of record uh, to stay in compliance into the future here. So what does compliance look like? Uh, so it's a matter of gathering all of your existing records, uh, consists of material identifications, construction records, histor historical water system records, et cetera, and then identifying the materials that go into that. So uh, obviously we want to go ahead and identify any uh, lead service lines that are lead, but also anything that's a galvanized pipe that is downstream of a lead service line. And then we also identify which pipes are not lead as well as which ones we have not been identified what yet, have, have not been inspected and we'll mark those as unknown. And obviously uh, location is gonna be extremely important in all of this. Uh, these are gonna be uh, a lot of buried lines, a lot of addressing, and so using a high accuracy GPS receiver to get your precise location of all of these lines uh, saves, you know, can save thousands and thousands of dollars in the future, uh, just in just purely in time saving costs, but it also creates a quality uh, system of record that has integrity that can be trusted. So really the long and short of it today is uh, that the pro this process is gonna consist of plan, navigate, understand, capture, monitor. So the first step is gonna be planning. Uh, this is gonna be your visual representation and mapping, creating your GIS, allowing both internal stakeholders as well as the public uh, to be able to visualize like, service lines and see what the status of that is, see which ones have been replaced and see where the areas of need are. Uh, this creates a sort of workflow of data-driven decision-making for all of, uh, all of the decision-makers in local governments. It's uh, going to be a living data set that provides municipalities with comprehensive data on the lead service lines uh, with all the information you could ever need to know about the location, material, age, and uh, any other relevant attributes. Uh, finally, when it actually comes time to uh, go and replace those lines, inspect them, uh, ArcGIS makes it super easy and we'll train you up on how to do this. Uh, just use ArcGIS field maps. It's an all-in-one app that allows you to navigate to the lines, understand all of that attribute information about them, and then finally capture any new location information or update those uh, inspections. Uh, so, and then finally, we need to be able to monitor all of this data that we're collecting. And the uh, ArcGIS solution uh, that Howard displayed earlier it has this uh, lead service line dashboard which is the next centralized location to uh, view and report service line stats and uh, go ahead and create quick and dynamic visualizations, saving you know loads of time and money. So finally, what's the uh, benefit of using digital maps? Uh, these tools are going to facilitate the seamless generation of required reports. Uh, reports are always going to be legally required. Uh, so why not make it as efficient and organized as possible? Uh, Real-time status updates, in-depth analytical capabilities. Uh, this is going to be the most powerful way for you to uh, actually you know, comply with all these regulations. So uh, what are these solution benefits uh, that we can train you on and help you uh, implement your own organization? So uh, as I've mentioned a few times, regulatory compliance, the whole point of this is to comply with the lead and copper rule revisions. Uh, this is going to enhance your data management. It's going to be a central platform for managing organizing data. So instead of dealing with uh, data sort of divided up 
in multiple locations. It just simplifies the workflow for utility departments. And then finally, it allows for a transparency for local governments, allowing the public uh, to see exactly what the status is of uh, the lead service lines in their community. So how do we get there? Uh, we we go ahead and we don't just, again, we don't just do hardware. Battle has been a GNSS hardware company for a long time, long time, but we've been doing trainings for several years now. Uh, we've done the work. I have uh, years of expertise on our team, and we understand what metadata is needed for future proofing, as well as best practices for GPS. Our uh, hardware is extremely intuitive. Uh, there's going to be uh, many regulations coming. You know, the most recent one is 2021. There's a deadline 2024. Uh, there's going to be new datums uh, coming up in 2025. And so we need to be able to adjust all of our location data and GNSS hardware to adjust for that. And so we'll guide you along that way. We'll make it simple for you as far as uh, taking you from zero to hero and get you up and running for your GIS and all your field data collection workflows. So finally, just a quick overview of the kind of receivers you would be using. Uh, these are the ones we provide, but uh, there's several manufacturers. Effectively, it's going to be a survey grade level receiver and then your field data collection receiver. So the Battle Flex, that'll get you all the way to survey grade, one centimeter accuracy uh, using an RTK network, a local corrections network. And then finally, we have the extremely portable and uh, simple to use Battle Flex Mini, which will get you a sub foot all the way around a meter or so at a you know affordable sort of price. So you just have to determine uh, which regulations have been set by your municipality, what your accuracy requirements are, and there will be a uh, appropriate GNSS receiver for you. All right. Uh, Please uh, visit our hub site. We do have a great hub site at uh, arcgis.com or also bad-elf.com. Uh, please contact us. And I would like to pass it over to Dunry Grindley from uh, Blue Conduit. Thanks. Thank you, David. Hello, everybody. My name is Dunry Grindley, and I'm coming to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Go Blue, just down the road from Brian. I joined Blue Conduit in 2021 to help get the lead out across the nation sharing my slides. So my goal in this presentation is to increase your curiosity about how predictive modeling can help your community comply with the lead and copper rule revision, get the lead out of the ground more quickly and more efficiently. Oh, right. Next slide, come on. Blue Conduit originated the approach of using predictive modeling and machine learning for lead service line inventory and replacement and we've been doing it longer than everybody else. We developed our first predictive models in response to the Flint water crisis as a student and faculty project from the University of Michigan in 2016. Our predictions of where the lead was in Flint improved their planning, reduced their cost per successful replacement, and most importantly, provided replacement priorities based on risk of lead exposure. Since that time, other municipalities and water utilities have asked us to help them so we created a company in 2019 and software to streamline this process for utility customers. So far, we've worked in over 200 communities across the nation. Actually, I think it's 250 now. And we've inventoried more than 2 million service lines serving more than 5 million people. Going to the bottom left, we help our water utilities dig where the lead is to remove it. The hit rate, which is one but not the only measure of our success, measures our accuracy. An over 80% hit rate means that when we predict service line materials and the utility does a visual inspection or a dig, 80% of the time there's lead. We've saved our cities money by helping them replace lead pipes and avoid digging expensive holes to find copper. And most importantly, we've helped them reduce lead exposure by replacing lead pipes in the right order. What I should say here, and it doesn't say yet on the slide, is that we've become an Esri Silver partner and are integrated with their LSLI solution that Howard and Alex already spoke about. And that means we're delivering our machine learning predictions to the GIS that our utility customers are using on a daily basis. So this gives you a little more sense of our geographic spread. Uh, the green shows the states we're working in. And of course that's uh, Nova Scotia uh, in Canada on the far right. 
So if you've gotten to this point in the presentation, you'll know that in a little less than a year, a service line materials inventory is due to your state agency. There's not enough time between now and then to dig everywhere to discover what's in the ground. There's not enough money. And that wouldn't even be the right way. We can do it smarter. We've been, doing, we've been helping water utilities understand where the lead is in the ground for a while. And we wanted to share some key tips that we see work well for them. Like in anything, the first step is assessing where you are, figuring out what records you have. Brian talked about all the records that Detroit, all the information Detroit is bringing to bear to help them in their work and lead service lines. And we're proud to be part of that. And most importantly, understanding how much you can trust the information you have. Second, for most utilities, once you review the data you have, there will be gaps. You will have lines that you don't know the material for. And I wanna show you how predictive modeling can help you fill in those gaps and let you know that regulators are increasingly accepting predictive modeling as a method for service line investigation. And I won't have much time in this presentation, but Howard already mentioned this. I wanna underscore how important it is to think of inventory as a continuous process rather than a one-time thing. Especially if you're doing predictive modeling, the model will improve as you feed information from the replacements back into it. So why are we here? Why is this a challenge? Well, it turns out most cities do not know where their lead service lines are located. Many of them are dealing with analog tap cards and historical maps, which are labor intensive to digitize and also inconsistent with the reality on the ground. Um, people are digitizing um, paper records, um, sometimes unable to tell the difference between a handwritten C for copper and a handwritten L for lead, voiding the work, right? These service lines have been in the ground for more than, some of them maybe 100 years. And while accurate at the time they were recorded, reality has diverged from the records and the records may no longer be true. So how do you create an inventory? How do you power those beautiful maps that um, Brian showed, that Alex and um, Howard showed without being able to trust the data that's going into it. This is how unreliable records can be. And this is from our work with the city of Toledo, Ohio, um, just south of Detroit. Um, and it shows uh, some sampling of locations in the map on, in their city that we can compare what the record that the city of Toledo had to what was found in a hydroback inspection. You can see in the, the blue dots on the map are locations where the records match. The yellow dots are locations where the records said something different than the ground reality. So how do you cope with this? <laughs> That's where Blue Conduit originated. That's where we come in. Um, we use predictive modeling and machine learning to do this. A predictive model uses known information to predict what is unknown service line materials in this case. A model can use many inputs, um, all the stuff that Brian talked about, the historical records, information about the local built environment, such as build year, uh, zoning, location, demographics, information about fire hydrants and local water samples. And the process is iterative. You use where lead is found and where lead is not found to make better predictions. So this is, um, uh, a map of the verified information in Toledo's inventory. Yes, they had records. No, um, they all couldn't be trusted. Um, and so this is the verified piece. You'll see that lead is in red, non-lead is blue, galvanized in purple, but most of the map is unknown, not verified. With the our work together, they were able to, come on. Uh, we were able to fill in the gap, right? Um, show where the lead was, um, and that is the golden color, the darker yellow um, is higher probability of lead, um, blue uh, is low likelihood of lead. And with the information on where the lead was in their community, just like Detroit, they were able to secure funding. And Toledo, we're, I'm really proud, and they're really proud to say that with the funding that they've received, they're able to replace the entire service line at no cost to the homeowners, um, with uh, funding that they were able to secure. And they were able to prioritize, just like Brian said, neighborhoods and um, homes on streets for replacements with this information. 
Um, and Toledo is recognized as a, as a leader. The EPA administrator visited there to highlight the work that they're doing in lead service line replacement. You might wonder, well, it all sounds great, but um, I have to comply with my the EPA and the state, and do they accept this? Um, the EPA guidance for developing and maintaining a service line inventory includes predictive modeling and mentions us, which we're super proud of. Um, I'm happy to direct you to that if you wanna get a hold of me. Um, and it includes predictive modeling for the investigation method for each side of the line. So you see here, this is from the EPA um, spreadsheet template and predictive modeling is an option for the system owned portion, the material classification, as well as the customer owned portion. And states are following suit. Many of them are just following the EPA guidance and some of them are setting up their uh, state specific information. And you can come to our website and take a look at what your state says about predictive modeling and the guidance um, so that you can know for sure uh, and give you confidence. So quickly figure out what you don't know. Um, sometimes your records are deceiving you um, and to create an accurate inventory to do all the rest for EPA um, lead and copper roll compliance, you need that accurate inventory. You can reduce unknowns in that inventory, make it more accurate with predictive modeling and keep going especially if you're using a predictive model, feeding that new data as you do that real-time data back into the system so that you can have the most accurate predictions of where the lead is will serve you well. Uh, there's resources on our site, a, goal, a paper we did with ASDWA, a white paper on principles for lead service, data science principles for lead service line inventory and replacement. Encourage you to check that out. Um, we have guidance on how to evaluate predictive models and very recently, we did a, a co-authored a, a white paper with Jacobs on um, identifying galvanized service lines requiring replacement. We get a lot of questions about that. Another question we often get is how, I'm not finding any lead, what do I do? We have some information about that on our website too. So please visit, get a hold of me if you can't find it. I can help you. All right, thank you so much. I hope I've increased your uh, curiosity about predictive modeling, happy to talk through more details. And at this point, I'd like to invite all of the other presenters back on screen to take any questions from the audience. All right. This was fantastic. So if we can all give a hand to our amazing panelists. So thank you, Howard, Alex, Brian, David and Donri for your insights. It was really end to end. I personally enjoyed, um, you know, learning about uh, literally the whole workflow. I love uh, your point, Donri, about this is not a one time thing. This is a process. I loved when I heard uh, this combination of data. I think Brian, you know, had <clears throat> all the data that he asked, you know, our audience to pick from. And then our ESRI uh, essentially partners going really through the process and having templates for the, uh, the users for sharing the information. I love the outreach part and I love the customer involvement, you know, so the assessment even from the customer. Um, and of course, you know, the, the role of predictive modeling and then, you know, Dave, the GNSS, the precision, the precision. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you for the hundreds of people who are, have joined us. We have many questions. Let's see how we can get through them uh, as much as we can. So maybe, I could start with uh, Howard and Alex. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start with a very easy question. And I think others, you still have time. If you want to add your questions to the Q&A, please feel free as we're speaking. Um, a simple question. I think there were a, quest a couple of questions. If you can just remind us again, Howard and Alex, on how do we get that module from Esri? I think that would help as a reminder before I give you the really hard questions. <laughs> sure. So the easiest way to get it is to go to esriurl.com slash lead. 
So that'll bring you right to the um, actual deployment screen if you're going to deploy it into ArcGIS Online. And then uh, on that screen, there's a uh, also a link for um, get more information. That'll bring you into the documentation. We'll explain, and and that'll explain to you if you're using ArcGIS Enterprise how to deploy it in your enterprise environment. Uh, also, Google works really well, so uh, you can just type into Google Esri uh, Lead Service Line Inventory, and that'll also bring you right into uh, the documentation or you can deploy it there as well. Thank you so much. That's much appreciated. Um, so sort of a follow on question, how how can one modify your solution? So the lead service line inventory solution to uh, perhaps incorporate additional information that you know my state or my region requires. Could you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the solution can be modified. You can modify the schema. Um, we do recommend not deleting um, fields from the schema, um, but you can certainly add uh, to the schema. Um, and just want to make sure that what you are adding is being um, you know, attended to in, in the maps and the apps that are consuming that schema as well. That's great. Thank you so much. So, uh, Donry, let me go back to you again with sort of like, you know, the easy questions first. Um, you know, say I'm a utility and uh, I'm thinking of using the predictive modeling uh, approach that uh, you presented, uh, but most people are probably not experts at it. So if you can help us in how we get started or we even choose an approach for success. Thank you for that question. Yeah, we've been working with utilities on predictive modeling for a long time now. So we've seen a lot of approaches. Um, people often start with that home age, right? That Brian talked about that depending on when they stopped installing um, service lines uh, based on the local ordinances matters. Um, but more than home age also matters. We found additional metrics in there. So I would, um, to evaluate, I would look at what, how the model deals with how you take the historical data, whether you take that as truth, um, because it doesn't, uh, not always true. Um, there's a great web paper on our site that I can point you to um, for more information. Uh, so yeah, how you evaluate the historical information, whether you're using more than home age, how you, um, well, how you define success. In the, for instance, for lead service lines, you want to define success as finding all the lead. So actually accurately predicting where the lead is, you might want to over predict so that you find it all because success is getting it all out of the ground, not necessarily being super accurate. Um, so our data scientists are often uncomfortable with that hit rate metric. People like it, it's sexy, but it's incomplete because you want to get the lead out of the ground, not have the most accurate model. So how it works in the field to get the lead out of the ground is probably the most important thing. That makes a lot of sense. And I love that uh, Brian was shaking his head. So let me, because uh, I think he's like, you know, I've, I've experienced this myself. I, uh, let me ask another question uh, before, you know, I go to you, Brian. So Dunry, there's this question about what is the source of information for states that accept the predictive modeling methodology? And in this case, I think it's coming from uh, somebody from the state of Texas saying that they're not currently accepting the methodology mm -hmm. for investigation or the material assignment for the unknown service lines, but they're using it sort of like a verification, field verification. So can you comment on, on that? I think it's still valuable for utilities to use predictive modeling, regardless of whether it is an acceptable verification method for the state and will help shape and guide field work and replacements. I can't speak to Texas in particular. I defer to the, the questioner's understanding of their state. I would encourage you to look at what we say about Texas on our site um, because we will um, be cross-checking um, to have a link over to what Texas says um, and our interpretation of it. So I can't speak to Texas without more research, um, but I would encourage you to do it. It's valuable even if it's not for the inventory only, because it does guide the resource allocation and planning. Yeah. 
Uh, I think we all agree. I love the seeing Howard smile <laughs> when you said it's still valuable. Uh, so Ryan, let me go to you because you've sort of experienced this. So maybe you, can you comment on the same question? Uh, you know, what's your experience been with predictive modeling and how useful has it been in, in your work for your success? That's a very valid question. And we've experienced it obviously in the field here in Detroit. Um, what, where it helps us is to prioritize where we're using dollars. So where we see density in the predictive map and the GIS layers that we, that I shared in my presentation, where we see density that's and vulnerability of populations, that's where we're going to go to first. But we still have to, like Dunry said, that that is not completely perfect. We still have to excavate every stop box at every house. So even though there may be density of lead lines, there may be 80 houses, we think there's 50 lead service lines, we're still going to excavate every stop box when we get to that neighborhood, verify that they have lead or not, and put that data in our mobile app collector that uses ArcGIS and uh, update our data that way and update the map and a live feed. So, um, we still have to do that. And we, in Detroit, we have, while well, we have 80,000 lead service lines, we predict we have 300,000, 300,000 services. <laughs> so eventually we have to uh, have eyes on those and have dug those up at some point to verify what material they are. So you sort of led into one of the questions from the audience that was, uh, how do you estimate your total lead lines? Well, we estimated our 80,000 based on permit data, based on if that permit data showed that at some point since 1948 or whenever the house was built, since 1923, um, if they got a permit to, and they replaced their service line, so then they are knocked off the list. If they didn't get a permit, and they are estimated that they have a lead service line. We also use probability. So when we've done water main replacement, we think there's uh, out of the 15 houses, we think there's eight lead service lines. Well, we may have found only two. So then we use those probabilities in our uh, mapping. Because at, at one point, when we started this process in 2018, we estimated we had 150,000, 150,000 lead service lines. It should be, yeah, that take us, uh, that would be, my daughter would be replacing lead service lines. That would take another generation, right? So uh, fortunately, we refined the data with permit data, uh, with eyes on it. Our meter, you know, there's meters in houses. We have to go to inspect the meter once in a while or when uh, ownership changes hands and do a meter reading if necessary. And so when we have eyes on the basement or the crawl space, we're able to update the data and say, oh, this is lead, this is not lead. So there's many ways to input the information and um, update the map, the probability. Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think uh, because this, when we talk about the estimation and Donry said it, you said it, Howard said it, David said it, the word trust, right? I think we're all doing all of this so that the consumer, us, me, right, can actually trust the approach, the replacement and the communication that's coming. So. Uh, there was a question from the audience on Detroit specifically about the percentage of Detroit residents who perhaps refuse to the replacement because of either the cost or the trust. Can you comment on that? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm glad you brought it up. So uh, first of all, we when we replace the full lead service line, whether it's a full one or we have to replace even the private portion, we pay for the cost. We don't charge the homeowner. We don't charge the resident. We allow uh, the adult occupant to give us permission. Um, we've been doing that since 2018. We've never been challenged on it uh, because Michigan, thankfully, uh, has a very stringent lead and copper rule. So in 20 years, we have to replace the lead 
service line. They're mandating that the utility or the municipality does it as they replace the lead service line. So we use that to say that they'll occupant give this permission. We have 100% compliance. No one has refused to have their line replaced to have a essentially a $12,000 improvement to their house by having a new copper line. Um, we haven't had that. But we do have to do extensive outreach, as I shared in my last few slides. Uh, we spent $43 per house because since 1990s, Detroit has done a very good job of saying we have safe, clean drinking water. We were one of the first utilities to start using orthophosphate in the uh, distribution system and the treatment process. So um, our water quality and our uh, water testing results, uh, we just got some back uh, for this year and it's 9.3 for our testing sample, 9.3 parts per billion. Uh, so we're very fortunate that our results continue to be low, uh, but we wanna, and we haven't been over the action level, but we wanna take the precaution and get the lead out. And we do have children with um, ele elevated blood lead levels in Detroit, but the primary source is lead paint, not drinking water, lead paint. So you answered another question. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I got a two for one deal. <laughs> and uh, by the way, the audience is very appreciative of you, uh, you know, taking the time to engage with us and answer the questions. So, uh, David, I have a couple for you. Uh, you want you want to take some? Um, this is one that is beyond my uh, understanding, but there was a question about when you were talking about your GNSS equipment, what is the accuracy rating of the bad elf flex with when paired with an RTK network? Yeah, so the accuracy when paired with the RTK network is going to be uh, about one centimeter to a two centimeter vertical. So the one centimeter is refers to the horizontal accuracy. Uh, vertical accuracy is typically going to be about one and a half to two times that. Uh, that is going to vary with how close you are to your base station. And they call that a baseline. So if you're really far away, that might degrade a little bit. But overall, you can expect about one centimeter or so. Uh, with our Battle Flex Mini, that can also use RTK corrections. But in that scenario, you're going to be looking at accuracy uh, less than a foot, just because it's you know a smaller, lighter weight receiver. So. Fantastic, thank you. And um, once again, I encourage you know our audience to keep asking questions. Uh, we're here for you. Um, so um, perhaps you can walk us through, David, because you've had this experience like on the ground. Uh, I'm a local government, so how do I get started? right managing my assets overall using gis and, and i love that you go literally from like you know the actual equipment all the way to the partnership with esri and others so can you can you share some of your wisdom with the audience <laughs> yeah so i i think the best way to get started is to one you know get a high accuracy gps device uh you know we don't want to be out here uh, connecting data with cell phones because in you know optimal conditions yeah you can definitely get satisfactory results but it's not going to be consistent and it's not going to have good data quality or integrity uh, so it's a matter of going out there following best practices uh, it's a matter of uh, actually you know letting the receiver get a good uh, GNSS fix have good accuracy and then using all of uh, Esri's awesome solutions uh, all these awesome pre-made templates to go out there and have them configured what's appropriate uh, for your organization. Because you can have all these forms and everything, but if the users don't understand how to use it or they don't configure it uh, well enough for their needs, a lot of that value is lost. So it's really just identifying uh, in a broader sense, uh, a specific area where you really need to start uh, you know, collecting and uh, implementing your GIS system, in this case, lead service line inventory and we've really seen in the past that that really gets the ball rolling and then actually rolls into other departments within your municipality as well and provides benefits over there fantastic thank you so since you mentioned your amazing partner esri let me go back to you know howard and alex um i like this question it says have you thought about uh exploring using computer vision ai ml for automated feature extraction from imagery 
that plugs into the GIS with 90 to 100 percent confidence. Well, in the core ArcGIS platform, yes, absolutely. Um, where, where there's actually a lot of use of AI and ML and future extraction for um, lots of different use cases. So that's something that's really just like a core capability within ArcGIS itself and heavily used nowadays. That's fantastic. Um, so unrelated question, but also related to the, you know, the Esri uh, module, essentially, is there a starting point to build the inventory. Uh, so the question is more specific. It says a client I support has a meter GIS layer. So aiming to understand if there are any benefits from loading the meter layer into the LSL point layer or using the meters as a point of reference um, or building the layer from scratch. I would say absolutely, right? So one of the tricks of doing this is, is looking at your existing data and figuring out, you know, how are you going to have your sort of first, you know, uh, the, 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 your first screen through, right? And so, yes, if you have meter data, absolutely. We have tons of utilities that have taken their meter, da meter data and they've loaded that in and they're using that as essentially the, you know, the proxy for your service line. If you have a meter, you must have a service line. So that's very common. We see people that uh, don't have a geospatial representation of their meters and they're geocoding their billing roster. So that's very common. We have some utilities that uh, have service lines mapped and oftentimes, and we didn't talk about this much on the call, but a, a lot of the challenges that utilities have is they, they may have mapped the utility side of the service line, but not mapped the private side of the service line. So we'll take the utility side of the line, they'll dissolve that line into a point and they'll use that as a, as a representation of the line and then they'll go out and then they'll do, you know, whatever investigation they need to populate the, you know, the private side of the line. So yeah, the trick of it is to look at your data, figure out what you have and how you can turn whatever data you have today into um, the first representation of your service lines. And then you're going to have to begin to do additional work to probably supplement that. I love this. And again, I think our audience is loving this because the questions are getting more sort of specific. You know, they're here because they want to know how to do this. So um, as a follow on to your answer, Howard, how do you recommend building the inventory when you do not have GIS? So what I would do is I assume that you're billing, you know, your customers in some way at your utility, right? So I would go to, if I had no spatial data, I go to my billing system. I go to my billing roster and I'd use people's addresses and I take that address data and I geocode it and I turn that data into points, right? And uh, address points. And I'd use those address points to begin to uh, understand, you know, where you need to, where, where you begin to need to do the work, right? So that's, that's, that's your representation essentially of you know where you have customers thus you must have service lines that makes sense thank you um can i go back to the predictive modeling i think don read that generated a few questions um, um because it really augments right you know this the, the the seeing the doing that being out there uh, and this one is again specific so thank you again for our audience for being this engaged uh, in, in this conversation. So this is a question um, uh, from the city of Gallup. Mm -hmm. And it says that we have around 7,000 services, uh, so less than Brian's. <laughs> and um, uh, the question was about whether there's a percentage mm -hmm. that they need to do the sort of like the physical verification before mm -hmm. going to predictive model and how many services we need to discover help <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question um yeah so it's probably fewer than you think to get started with a predictive model um uh we typically say about 20 percent of the unknown service lines so if they have 7,000 um in gallup um if there's probably not 7,000 unknowns so if you think about what the number of unknowns are um it could be something like 20%. So with 7,000, maybe like you know, less than 400 to get started. And then of course, that's not the end, right? It's just the beginning of um, using predictive modeling and that number um, as they complete their daily work of working in a utility and complete um, inspections and replacements, the model will get even more accurate from there. So people often think it's a lot more to get started with the unknown verifications. 
All right, I think, thank you. Uh, there were a couple of questions around this, so I'll sort of bundle them together. Uh, and I would appreciate, uh, I think, input from everybody because you're all into this. It's about the data. So Howard, Brian, David, you know, Dunry. Um, so to enable this effective predictive modeling, uh, what sorts of data attributes are needed to support this high likelihood hit rate for the prediction? There, there were a few questions here about, you know, what data do we need? Is it historical data, ordinance data, dates? Um, and this is a question for everybody because I think this is how we make this better. Uh, so Donri, do you want to start first? I mean, I think our data scientists would say, give us everything. <laughs> right? We'll take what you got um, and uh, yeah, um, we'll use it. Um, we do use the historical data, the date when the cutoff of the, the change in ordinance. Um, we'll use data on, you know, where the when the fire hydrant was upgraded, um, all sorts of things. Um, and the more data, the better. Um, but really for us, the key data is um, how we can trust the record. So that field verification, you have to base the predictive model on something real. And so getting those field verifications then allows you to take the rest of your data and use it to make predictions about what you don't know. Uh, Brian, Howard, or David, do you want to add to that? Yeah, adding to the what she mentioned about the field data, what Dunray just shared. Um, yeah, with our partnership with Blue Condo, we uh, excavated 384 talk stop boxes stop boxes on the service line to see what the data would show and use that as one of the inputs as a sampling in addition to the sampling we already had for a water main replacement or other lead service line investigations so you know it would be very costly for us to to come up with predictive modeling or do an inventory by digging up all the stop boxes <laughs> 300,000 of them to see how uh, good the data is. So a sampling is very important. Sounds good. I think uh, uh, we only have a few minutes left. Let me ask another simple question to Howard because you know, you're like the system that brings all of this together. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, are the tools going to be available on the desktop version to those of us who haven't made the transition to the online environment? So that's a great question. Uh, we designed this to work as a system, right? And so to do that, we either need ArcGIS online or the portal capabilities. If you're a GIS person, sorry, I'm getting a little technical here for a second, uh, or the portal capabilities in ArcGIS Enterprise, because that's what allows us to you know, empower the field crews to collect data out in the field and allow people to use the web applications. But if you were only using ArcGIS desktop, that is also fine. What you would do is you would still deploy this to ArcGIS Online. And if your organization has ArcGIS Desktop, you do have ArcGIS Online um, access to it, whether you're choosing to use it or not, right? That's that's fine. Um, so you would still deploy it and you would just go into ArcGIS Online and you would take the services that are deployed there and you would just um, bring them down to a, a, a local geo database. And you would just use that local geo database uh, in, uh, with, within, um, you know, within your local desktop environment. So you do not, even though we designed it to use online and we think strongly that because this is such a, you know, in larger organizations kind of a, you know, multi-role multi um, problem, right? In the office, in the field, you can absolutely export to a geodatabase and just use that geodatabase uh, in, uh, in online, or, or sorry, in the desktop. If you need help doing that, feel free to reach out to Alex and I, so we can help you offline um, do that. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let me see how I can wrap this up. I, I, this is such a unique webinar to me because it's not theoretical. It's not about future innovations or inventions. It's so focused on solving a specific problem and within a very, very tight time frame. right? That's how we started. It's, what was it, 2024, uh, which is like, now. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate the focus and you can see it from the questions of the audience, you know, they're here 
for that purpose as well to get practical guidance. So if we can wrap this up uh, with some closing remarks, perhaps. So I'd like to hear from every one of our amazing presenters. What's the biggest challenge right now as you're doing this? What is your biggest challenge? And what would you share with the customers to get them to uh, accelerate what they're trying to do? I think they're all trying to implement, either help support an implementation or implement or collect the data. So what's the biggest challenge and what would you tell them, you know, and because you've got all the wisdom right here on this webinar. I will, if I can start with, uh, with David, because, you know, we go from the ground up um so what's your what's the biggest challenge you've encountered or you think we're going to encounter and you know any uh any words of wisdom to accelerate um, yeah no I, I think one of the biggest challenges is really just uh really just convincing stakeholders within a lot of these local governments municipalities the power of gis uh a lot of it you know it really is an investment and uh it really starts over the system of record with how uh, you're the quality of your data so if you are uh you know doing any sort of as bills you know we're digging up uh lead service lines and everything uh we do want to make that as accurate as possible because even though it might not have any short-term implications you know long term we definitely do want to have that uh all, all location information be as precise as, as you can uh just for uh you know a multitude of different applications so it's uh, i think it's just a really just a matter of uh you know getting it implemented and just you know convincing stakeholders uh that it is important uh, that you know, accuracy does matter so thank you thank you david uh howard so i think the biggest challenge is uh actually confusion right and this is what we're seeing where there's a lot of utilities that know they need to do something, but they're confused about what the first step is to take. Um, so, you know, you, you have a lot of expertise, like we talked about in this call. There's a lot of expertise across the water utility community in general. So if you're not sure what to do, talk to other utilities. There's a lot of consultants that are doing great work in that space. Talk to them, uh, you know, talk to your state regulatory agencies if they have additional rules or things that they need that you need to capture because of the state that you're in. So I would literally, if you didn't know where to start, I would just start talking to, you know, your peers, other utilities, people in the industry, and they'll help you figure out what is the right first step to take. Sounds good. Alex, you want to add to Howard's response? Yeah, yeah, I think a, a really big challenge is, is the time, the time remaining. Um, and some, you know, utilities haven't even started, and it's probably a good time to get started uh, as soon as possible. Um, and then in, in similar to what Howard was saying, uh, just reach out and ask questions where you, where you need to, you know, figure some things out. Um, I also just wanted to, I saw a few questions about it, and we didn't, I don't know if we addressed it. Um, the solution that we presented before is, if you have licensed Esri licensing, it's uh, available at no additional cost. So I know there were some questions about cost and how much it was. Uh, it's available at no additional cost. So I just wanted to clear that up. Super, thank you so much. Brian. So our, our two biggest challenges, one is money. $800 million is a significant cost time. Um, we have 20 years in the state of Michigan to do that. We expect that the EPA will match some of Michigan's stringent lead and copper rule um, when they announce it soon. Uh, so time and money. Uh, on the residential side, there's extensive time for outreach, and we have to get we do have to get the homeowner or the adult occupant to sign an agreement to allow us to replace their private portion of the line. So there is uh, that extensive outreach to do so, but we've had 100% compliance and um, and word of mouth too. So if someone gets a lead service line replaced, they're telling their neighbor or their family member or friend in a different neighborhood. So they want to get on the list. So word of mouth has been very important to us and helped ease one of the challenges of, of getting that uh, agreement signed and getting the replacement schedule. Thank you, makes a lot of You're sense. Welcome. Donry, any closing thoughts on challenges and next steps? Well, I want to congratulate everybody who's here because you are ahead of the game by dealing with this. We still talk to people who don't seem to know that something's due in a year. 
um, and it's less than a year now. So, um, and when Brian talked, you know, he, they started in 2018 um, very proactively and, and they're well on their way to um, meet all the deadlines, um, I believe. And so get started, um, put your data uh, into your GIS. <laughs> we love it when um, our cu customers are using Esri's LSLI. It makes our lives really easy to pull the data over and push our predictions back. Um, uh, and leverage the work of the communities that have gone ahead of you. Like Howard said, reach out. Um, I bet Brian will take your call. Um, and there's <laughs> lots of communities um, around the nation who are doing great work that you don't have to reinvent. That's fantastic and a, and a great message. So uh, let's not reinvent the wheel. Uh, the challenge is obviously not technology, it's it's time, it's confusion, it's money, it's resources. And I think that's why this team here is putting this webinar for you. Uh, so you have a go-to point right now, a starting point uh, of examples and of tools and of wisdom. The webinar is recorded, so you can come back to it and everybody's contact information will be shared. Uh, again, I would thank the audience for staying with us, you know, a few hundreds of you, which is fantastic. Thank you. And special thanks to Howard, Alex, Brian, David, and Donry for uh, being with us and sharing your insights and your experience. And uh, going back to thank you to the organizers of this uh, webinar series overall. So thank you, Bad Elf. I love the name. <laughs> um, and I hope everybody has a great day. Everything is recorded and available for download. And uh, you'll get a certificate of attendance if you want it. Thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Let's, let's make our water better for all of us. Thank you.